empty souls. You know, there are a lot of empty souls in the world today. You've seen them. You know, the, the eye is the mirror of the soul. And have you ever walked up to someone and started talking about your relationship with your father or Jesus? And boom, the blinders go on, the scales come across their ears. A lot of, and I mean, they're not just, you know, running low. They're not running on fumes. They are totally, spiritually empty souls. The word empty uh, that we're going to be looking at in the Old Testament comes from a Hebrew word that's transliterated R-A-K-E, pronounced rake. That's real difficult, isn't it? But, yeah, it means empty, all right, but check it out. Figuratively speaking, the word empty means worthless. And you think about that, and you know, an, an empty soul is as worthless to God as a vehicle that doesn't have any fuel is to us. Have you ever tried to use a car that doesn't have any gasoline in it? Can't use it. It's the same with God. He cannot use an empty soul. Someone who is an empty soul is spiritually dead. You know, they either deny that there is a God or they ignore God altogether. They, they have no relationship with our Father at all. And therefore, when it comes time for him to dole out blessings, do you know what they get? Nada. Nothing. Most of them probably have never felt the Holy Spirit's warmth when he touches your heart, as you and I have. And is an empty soul empty forever? No way. You know, those empty souls are our brothers and sisters. They're just as much God's children as we are. And it's not God's will that one of them should perish, but that all would come to repentance. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 will document that. Our main task in this dispensation, I think, in this generation, should be filling those empty souls. How do you fill an empty soul? What, what do you fill an empty soul with? That's going to be the, the subject of our lecture today. So if you would, open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 29, verse 1. This chapter covers how things are going to be just before our Lord and Savior returns at the second advent. And uh, you know that that's now. That's this generation. We're living it. Let's ask that word of wisdom in Jesus' precious name, Isaiah 29, verse 1. Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. Add ye year to year, let them kill sacrifices. And this add ye year to year simply means let the feast days revolve for one year. In this case, probably from one Passover to the other Passover. Now, Ariel, interesting word, uh, check it out, it means hearth or altar of God. The word in your Strong's Concordance, the same word, also another, it's the word numbered before Ariel in your Strong's Concordance is what I'm trying to say, means, has a different meaning. It means the Lion of Judah. Who is the Lion of Judah? Jesus Christ is the Lion of Judah. Here we're talking about the city where uh, David dwelt, obviously Jerusalem, and that is where the altar of God was at this time. Yet I will distress, this is the Lord speaking, Ariel, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be unto me as Ariel. She shall prove herself to me to be Ariel. Uh, you know, our father is a consuming fire, and that altar, the place where people at this time of the right, this writing made sacrifices there, but what else is going to be outside of Jerusalem? God's a consuming fire. Where does Satan and those that reject God go? Into that lake of fire. So uh, we can kind of read that into this as well. And I, the Lord speaking, will camp against thee round about, and will lay siege against thee with a mount 
and I will raise forts against thee. Now, Mount, you know, at this time, cities that were walled, uh, the main way to attack them was to build up uh, rocks or dirt, and that's what a mount is, against the wall, to where people could cross over the wall. And thou shalt be brought down, and shalt speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low of the dust, low out of the dust. And thy voice shall be as one that hath a familiar spirit, an evil spirit, no flesh, no skin, no bones. Out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. When God sieges, when God goes to war, he doesn't mess around. He takes care of the enemy, and that's what this is talking about. Verse 5. Moreover, the multitude of the strangers, or the foes, if you will, shall be like small dust, easily blown around, especially if the wind blowing them is the holy ruach. And the multitude of the terrible ones shall be as chaff that passeth away, also easily blown about. Yea, it shall be at an instant suddenly. And what instant are we talking about? We're talking about the second advent. But now how is it before then? Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts. This is not a good visitation. This is one you don't want to partake in. Of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 29. Our God is a consuming fire. And the multitude, this is Hamon in the, great, in the, the Hebrew language, might remind you of Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 11, where we have another Hamon. It's called Hamon Gog, Haman Gog, which means the multitude of Gog. The nations that fight against Ariel, and even all that fight against her and her munition, and that distresser shall be as a dream of a night vision. It's going to be a nightmare, all right. Now, how is it going to be before the Lord returns? It shall even be as when an hungry man dreameth, and behold, he eateth, but he awaketh, and his soul, that's nephesh, is empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreameth, and behold, he drinketh, but he awaketh, and behold, he is faint and his soul hath appetite, so shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. I mentioned in the opening that there were a lot of empty souls, and you see it in the faces of those who deny God, that there is a God, or ignore him. Unfortunately, we can see it sometimes in the faces of those who are coming out of the traditional churches. Think about this spiritually, this verse we just covered. They're hungry, so what do they do? They go to church and they sit in a pew for 45 minutes. And when they come out of church, you see that same emptiness in their soul. Why? Because all too many of the churches are teaching the traditions of men, or sometimes you might get, uh, you know, 45 minutes on Aunt Monty's mint jelly. And, you know, Aunt Monty's probably a pretty good old gal, and I'll bet her mint jelly is really good. But that's not what the people go to church for. They go to the church, the house of God, Beth El, to hear the word of God, not about Aunt Monty's mint jelly. Unfortunately, many of the Beth El's have become Beth Avin which means house of nothing. And that's what they're getting. The people are hungry. This ministry, the growth of it is a witness that the traditional churches are not feeding the flock. And it's like they go to sleep and they dream that I just had a good meal, but they wake up and they're still hungry. That's the way they are when they leave church, unless God's word is being taught there. I don't mean to judge churches. Please don't take that wrong. Thank God for the churches, for at least they're teaching morals. But I wish a lot more of them would teach God's word. Nine, how it's going to be before Christ returns. Stay yourselves in wonder. Stop. Look what you're doing. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. 
They're intoxicated on the traditions of men. Self-inflicted. Now, there's something else that comes upon them that's not self-inflicted. It's God's judgment on dead works. Verse 10. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets, false prophets, and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. Seers, just another word for prophets. But the, the rulers, the heads who are supposed to be uh, knowledgeable in God's word, the, the prophets who certainly, the teachers, certainly should be knowledgeable in God's word, how can they teach if, if, the, if God has closed their eyes? And again, this is judgment for dead works. And I believe in some cases to protect those individuals so that they're un, unable to commit the unforgivable sin. Verse 11, and the vision, check this word vision out, it's revelation. The revelation of all is becoming to you as the words of a book that is sealed, a book that's closed, which men deliver to one who is learned, learned in the traditions of men, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. How many times have you heard a preacher on television say, you don't have to read, the understand, read and understand the book of Revelation. You're going to be out of here. You're going to fly away like a bird. We're living it, folks. Verse 12. And the book, the Revelation, is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. I'm hungry. And he saith, I am not learned. Not very many reading, understanding, and teaching the word today. The result, verse 13, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, they talk a good game, and with their lips do honor me, with their words they honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, the Lord speaking, and their fear, or revere, if you will, reverence toward me, is taught by the precept of men, the traditions of men. Jesus quoted Isaiah in Matthew chapter 12 and Mark chapter 7 in regards to this. You remember the scribes and Pharisees asked Christ, why don't your disciples wash their hands according to the traditions of the elders? The traditions of men. And Jesus said, well did Esaias, or Isaiah, prophesy saying of you you'll draw close to the Lord with your mouth your words but your heart is far far from him Moses told us to honor our mother and father but you say it's Corban a word that simply means a gift to the church in other words it's all right to let your mother and father starve to death in order for you to make a gift to the church Moses didn't teach that you're teaching that. And Christ goes on to tell them, you with your traditions make the word of God of non-effect. Avoid the word of God. We're living it. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid to believe a lie, if you will. And, you know, those today, we have a lot of wise people, but they're not wise in God's word. They're wise in the ways of the world. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. Can you imagine someone being so stupid as to try and hide their plan from God? And their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us? And who knoweth us? God sees, God knows. At the time Isaiah is writing this, the people were talking about, well, what can we do? The Assyrian is really a problem. Let's run to Egypt and ask Pharaoh for protection. Maybe we can make an alliance with Pharaoh. God wanted Israel to depend on him, not Pharaoh. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. 
You know who the potter's clay is, don't you? That's us. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not. How would you like to be an evolutionist standing before the white, great white throne judgment having said these very words? God didn't make me. Denying the very creator. Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding. They, they accredit the cleverness to themselves. God didn't do it. You know, I'm, I'm this... <laughs> Uh, smart and intelligent or good looking or whatever because I am I did it myself it's not the way it happens folks God makes us the way we are this turning of things upside down we see that today you teach God's truth and you're going to be criticized for it in other words what is right is going to be called wrong and what's wrong is going to be called right that's what turning things upside down from God's plan is all about. Verse 17. Is it not yet a very little while, and Lebanon, the cedars of Lebanon, the forest, shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest. This is a, a proverbial saying, and what it means is things are going to be changed. People are going to be changed. Things are going to change. And it's just in a little while. Well, when is that? Verse 18. And in that day, what day are we talking about? You know the thousand years, the millennium? What's it called? The Lord's Day? Shall the deaf hear the words of the book? Those who are spiritually deaf will hear. And the eyes of the blind, spiritually blind, shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The truth is going to be taught. The meek or persecuted also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor or humble among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. There is going to be a spiritual healing at that time. For the terrible one, hmm, let's see, who could that be? Hmm, the terrible one. How about Satan and his role as Antichrist? Is brought to naught, and the scorner, or the mockers, is consumed, and all that watch or wait for iniquity are cut off. And that God, our consuming fire, uh, forms that lake of fire. Those who have rejected him and follow Satan will go right where he's going into the lake of fire. 21, that make a man an offender for a word. This is really kind of loses it. It, it. Who bring a man to condemnation by a word. And that's to say false teaching, false witness. And lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate. For those who try and do right, the gate of course being the place of judgment, the court. And turn aside the just for a thing of naught. Turning things upside down. Just is what's right, not is wrong. And we see it today. Turning things upside down. What's called right is wrong, and what's wrong is called right. Therefore, thus saith the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, all twelve tribes. Jacob shall not now be ashamed, neither shall his face now wax pale, pale from shame. And you know, your face doesn't have to be uh, ashamed either. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So, fortunately, not all will be ashamed when Christ returns. Those who rightly divide the word are, are not in that group. 23. But when he seeth his children, this is still talking about Jacob, the work of mine hands, who created them? God created them. In the midst of him they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and shall fear the God of Israel. They'll reverence the God of Israel based on the command of God, not on the precept of men. They also that erred in spirit, those who got sucked up into the false religions, 
shall come to understanding, and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. I look forward to that day. We'll see those blind ears come off of the eyes. We'll see the scales fall away from their ears, and they'll be able to hear and understand. Turn over just a page or two with me to chapter 31, verse 8. There is going to be a righteous king ruling, and things are going to be set right. What is right is right, and what is wrong will be called wrong. Chapter 31, Isaiah, verse 8. Then shall the Assyrian fall with the sword. The Assyrian is who? The Antichrist, a type for the Antichrist. Not of a mighty man, this is Ish, and the sword not of a mean man, this is Adam. Well, if it's not the sword of a man who's going to bring the Antichrist to not, which, what sword is it? Shall devour him, but he shall flee from the sword. Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. What's the tongue of Jesus Christ? A two-edged sword that cuts both ways. That is what will bring Antichrist to naught. And the, his young men, those who are with Antichrist, shall be discomfited. And he, the Antichrist, shall pass over to his stronghold for fear. And his princes shall be afraid of the ensign, saith the Lord, whose fire is in Zion. This is not Ariel in the Hebrew, but it sure made me think about Ariel, the hearth, the altar of God, and his furnace in Jerusalem, that lake of fire waiting on Antichrist. Chapter 32, we find three blessings that are going to come about at this time. All of them have to do with things being turned upside right. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. That's not been the way in quite a while, particularly when Antichrist is going to be in Jerusalem. Of course, the king is king of kings, lord of lords, Jesus Christ. Things, no more turning things upside down. And princes shall rule in judgment. Hmm, now who could these princes be? How about you? Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. What are the overcomers, those who don't take the mark of the beast, those who don't worship the Antichrist? What is their reward? To reign with Christ a thousand years. Ever think of yourself as a prince or a princess? You are, and what a team. Verse 2, And a man, Christ, shall be as in hiding place from the wind. Protection, in other words. And a covert from the tempest, the storms, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. And I hope Christ is your protection. You know, that shadow of a great rock. I hope your shadow is Jesus Christ, because there's someone else who wants to be your shadow. One of the first parables of the Bible, Judges chapter 9, they were looking for a king, you remember, and they went to the different trees, and the olive and the fig and the vine all said, no way, I got better things to do than to be your king. But the thorn bush, symbolic of Satan, said, you can rest in my shadow, I'll be your king. Thornbush doesn't have much of a shadow. And the eyes of them, here we have our second blessing. The first blessing, of course, was a righteous king. The second blessing. And the eyes of them that see shall not be dim, shall no more be dim, I'll translate. And the ears of them that hear shall hearken. A time of new understanding, a time of spiritual healing. The heart also of the rash, translate hasty, they're hasty to run to the traditions of men or false religions, shall understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerers shall be ready to speak plainly or elegantly. And some think these stammerers are stutterers, and it may well be. I think it's those who are unable to think or speak with any certainty uh, at all of things pertaining to God. And, and when their eyes are open, when their ears are open, and they understand, uh, 
then they will be able to speak of things of a certainty concerning the holy things of God. Verse 5, the third blessing. The vile person shall be no more called liberal. And this really needs some help. A vile person is one who's a fool. A liberal person, as it's utilized here, means noble. In other words, things turned upside down. We're calling fools noble. Nor the churl. A churl is a covetous miser. Can't get enough material possessions. Said to be bountiful or rich. Again, you see the, the, the analogy here pointing to things being upside down. And, and no more is that going to be the case. Sharpen up for me the reason we came here. For the vile person, the fool will speak villainy or foolishness. Anyone who listens to a fool is a bigger fool than the fool. And his heart or his mind will work iniquity. This word, check it out, is avin. Iniquity is avin in the Hebrew. It means false. It can mean evil. It can mean nothingness, not. To practice hypocrisy. In the New Testament, the word hypocrisy, do you know what it means in the Greek? It means a stage actor. And what we got here are people, fools, who are playing church. And to utter error or lies against the Lord. To make empty the soul of the hungry. And he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. We've got a lot of... One verse Charlie's, the people are hungry, but they're never quite getting around to teaching God's word. And what they do teach is to utter error, lies in other words, and hypocrisy. They're playing church. The people are hungry and want to be fed. And what do they get? Lies and hypocrisy. Things are going to be made right. Verse 7. The instruments also of the churl, that's the covetous miser, are evil. He deviseth wicked devices to destroy the poor with lying words. How about usury? Does that come to mind? Maybe is that one of the things that the churl devises? Even when the needy speaketh right. Even when the, the humble want to do what is right. Verse 8 but the liberal, remember that means noble, deviseth liberal things, noble things. And by liberal or noble things shall he stand. He will stand for what's right at that point. No more the fool called noble. And what does that mean? That means you're probably calling the noble a fool. So things are going to be made right. When someone is extremely thin, today, we say oftentimes that they're skin and bones. There are some empty souls that are so empty that they're just bones. And I bet many of you know where I'm going to take you right now, Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. And I'll remind you, at the end of Ezekiel 37 is where we have those two sticks joined back together, Judah and Israel. When is that going to happen? Well, it's not going to happen until the king of Israel returns. I'm talking about Christ. So, again, these events uh, at the beginning of chapter 37 are prophecy of, we're living it, folks. We're there. This is it, the generation of the fig tree. Chapter 37, verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me, Ezekiel speaking, and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. These are those who are spiritually dead. I mean, they're so spiritually dead, they don't even have any skin. It's all bones. And caused me to pass by them round about. Take a good look, Ezekiel. And, 